Thank you very much, Fabrice. Um, so this talk is about public key encryption, as maybe the session already suggests. Um, the accepted security notion for public key encryption is indistinguishability against chosen cipher text text. So just a brief uh, recap what that is. So uh, it's the same pictures as in the uh, as in the RAM session talk about fair security notions, but this time maybe we want to take the perspective of the challenger. So the good guy is the challenger and the bad guy is the adversary. That's exchanged. Um, so the adversary gets a public key, outputs two messages, and has to decide whether he gets an encryption of the left one or of the right one. And in the end, uh, the attacker will output this bit. Uh, we say that the scheme is secure if no attack, so if no efficient attack, can do this better than guessing, essentially, up to, non, uh, up to negligible um, differences, of course. And the first observation is that this security definition is simple, and you can even make it simpler if you, uh, if you consider, for instance, key encapsulation mechanisms. Uh, but it also covers only uh, a non-practical scenario. It cover covers a one user, one ciphertext scenario, and so it's not really a realistic security notion in itself. Uh, you can always say that in, this is like the standard argument. If you're only interested in polynomial security, then you can uh, argue that with a hybrid argument, uh, security in this NCCA, oops, sorry, uh, security in this uh, NCCA sense also gives you security in a multi-user, multi-ciphertext scenario. Um, however, it does not give you quantitatively the same security guarantees. You will lose, due to the hybrid argument, you will lose a bit of concrete security. Um, so you will get security guarantees that degrade in the scenario size. And in particular, if you don't know into which kind of setting, into which size, uh, this, in, into, which, in, into a setting of which size uh, your scheme is going to be deployed, you may have a hard time giving uh, reasonable security, uh, reasonable key length uh, recommendations in order to uh, give um, guaranteed or to, to assure guaranteed security. Okay, so what we're interested in this talk is uh, tightly secure public key encryption, and in particular, for at least for the purpose of this talk, so the paper is a bit more general, but uh, for, the uh, for the purpose of this talk, we're interested in multi-challenge chosen ciphertext security. This means it's the same as before, but the adversary gets uh, many encryptions of uh, pairs of messages or of one message where the adversary selects pairs. So this encryption step is just repeated and he always gets an encryption of the left or always an encryption of the right message and in the end he has to decide which, which is which. And this gives you, intuitively, uh, this gives you secure communication and setting with one user and many ciphertexts in, with a tight reduction. So there the security guarantees immediately relate to what you would encounter in an application with one user and many ciphertexts. And what we're interested in is to get a scheme, to get an encryption scheme uh, with a reduction that does not lose any, that does not lose any factor uh, in the number of ciphertexts that the adversary gets, in the number of challenge ciphertexts that the adversary gets. So we're interested in a reduction to a standard assumption, for instance, DDH or any other, pick your favorite computational assumption. And this reduction should be tight, which means that it does, the security guarantees or the reduction loss does not depend on the number of ciphertexts. And in particular, this enables you to give security guarantees for scenarios of a priori unknown size. And the problem with this is that standard techniques to prove chosen ciphertext security for public key encryption, they do not give you, they do not give you a reduction that fulfills this property. I can give you maybe a bit more uh, examples or a few more examples for that. So first of all, the picture above changed a little bit because now I've neglected the decryption oracle and I've neglected the public key and the final decision. I've just focused on the encryption queries. So the adversary makes many queries um, of message pairs and then gets the encryption either, in, in each case, either of the left or of the right message and always the same. Um, if we want to construct public key encryption, then we have a bunch of paradigms we could do this with. Uh, one paradigm is that uh, because it's chosen ciphertext security, you're in, in that dilemma, right, that you need to answer decryption queries in your security experiment, in your security reduction, but at the same time, you should not be able to decrypt the challenge ciphertexts, or you should at least be able to randomize the challenge ciphertexts in some sense, so that the adversary tells you something new if the adversary tells you what was encrypted. So uh, one paradigm to do this is uh, inspired by the identity-based encryption setting is that you have a reduction which knows a punctured secret key such that you can 
answer all decryption queries, but the secret key is punctured in the sense that for the challenge ciphertext, it will not work. It will just give you some division by zero error or something, some syntax error. So the, uh, the decryption key will not work for one particular ciphertext, and that's the ciphertext that you can randomize in the reduction, or that's the ciphertext that you can argue that the adversary tells you something new if the adversary tell <coughs> tells you what's inside. Unfortunately, this only allows you to randomize one ciphertext at a time. So the idea is in all these experiments, you want to randomize all those challenge ciphertexts, but uh, this punctured secret key approach only gives you a means to randomize one ciphertext at a time. Similarly, uh, if you construct uh, your encryption scheme from uh, in, the, in the hash proof system regime or with hash proof systems, then the strategy is a bit different. So there the reduction always knows the full secret key, but somehow makes uh, the challenge or one challenge ciphertext special and then kind of uh, you, you offload additional entropy in the secret key into the encryption of that ciphertext. So it's a bit funny because you use then the secret key to create encryption queries, and that secret key, uh, that secret key makes uh, the challenge ciphertext, works on the challenge ciphertext in a special way such that additional entropy in the secret key is kind of reflected then in this challenge encryption. But also, this is kind of an entropy argument. It argues that the secret key has more entropy than the public key and more than the adversary knows a priori. And this only um, gives you leverage to randomize a very limited number of ciphertexts, so one at a time. So this also doesn't work in a setting where you want to, where you want to randomize many challenge ciphertexts in, in few reduction steps or with, with little reduction loss. So then there's uh, an our young type double encryption. And maybe this is a bit already a kind of a complicated uh, description of the now young um, uh, of the now young paradigm um, and i'll go into more details how this works uh, in in a few slides so maybe just ignore this for the time being there's also something uh, with uh, some some uh, very old method to uh, to obtain chosen ciphertext security but it requires a very strong zero knowledge non detective zero knowledge proof and that's kind of uh, the difficulty that makes everything very hard when you go to the multi-challenge setting. Okay, so what, what's, what's in this work? In this work, um, okay, so first I should explain maybe the table. Um, so the known schemes are uh, in the upper part, and green means, green color means this is something good. So of course there's, there should be several shades of green maybe. So you have Kramer Schub or Kurosawa Desmet, and uh, Kurosawa Desmet is one group element. This is all in terms of group elements in the first two columns here. Uh, this is kind of one group element better, but it's all green, so it's all efficient, it's all practical, it's all something we could live with. Um, then there's the red part, which says this is something bad, which means in uh, Kramer Schub and Kurosawa Desmet, so in the upper part, these are the state of the art schemes with a non tight reduction. You have a non tight reduction, and this means that the security guarantees degrade in the scenario size. The assumptions from which we, uh, on which we rely here, they are very, very mild and, and standard and well investigated. So this is already green. This is again green. So then there's a bunch of works on achieving tight security, uh, and the problem with those was that something was inefficient there all the time. So in the beginning, this was uh, so the reduction was very, uh, very tight. So it just lost a constant factor. But then the ciphertext was huge. This relied on tree-based signatures, which were in the ciphertext, and this, was, this led to a very large ciphertext. This was improved. Uh, and now we're in the situation where you can choose whether you have a large public key or you have a, yeah, still kind of large ciphertext, and the other thing is then small again. And you have, a, you have still a kind of a tight reduction. So this is lambda as a security parameter, so this should be something like you lose something like 100. So you lose maybe like seven or eight bits in the, uh, of security due, uh, due to the reduction. Uh, but this is much better than losing, I don't know, two, uh, than losing 30 or 40 bits if you have a loss of Q here, the number of encryption queries. Okay, so this work, what does this work do? Um, we construct new schemes that are bad in different metrics or in a different combination of bad. So uh, one scheme still requires pairings. So PFG means pairing-friendly group. This is not what we would like to have. We would like to have a scheme based on a standard assumption like DDH. Decision linear is not so bad, but it, it requires you to use uh, symmetric pairings, this construction, and you, you have a pairing, and this makes it all pretty inefficient. But still, it's kind of six group elements. That's still something you could live with. And the public key is, yeah, kind of somewhere between bad and good. Um, 
so this is a new, uh, a new scheme we get in the, in the pairing regime, and we also get a new scheme uh, from the DCR assumption. In fact, what's interesting is that the main contribution of this work is that uh, we, get, we uh, present generic new techniques uh, to solve the problem and to randomize challenge ciphertext, and in particular, as a demonstration, this gives the first tightly secure public key encryption scheme, so tightly chosen ciphertext secure public key encryption scheme from uh, a DCR or DCR-like assumption. Okay, so maybe it's conceptually very interesting, but this is, I'm not suggesting that this is practical in the end. So you still have uh, 30 group elements in the ciphertext. So in the remaining talk, I will just give you like a hint or a glimpse at the techniques. Okay, so the basic strategy is, uh, so the first part is just copied, you can ignore the first part of the slide. Um, uh, it's, the idea is to start from now young double encryption. So this is uh, now young double encryption, and there a ciphertext consists of two encryptions under a, a mildly secure encryption scheme, under a chosen plaintext secure encryption scheme of the same message. So in, a, in an honest encryption, we have M0, M1 under different public keys, and you add a non-interactive zero-knowledge proof that the two M's are equal, so that M0 equals M1. And we call this a consistency proof. So consistent ciphertexts are those where you really encrypt the same thing. So where both ciphertexts C0 and C1 decrypt to the same message. And how would you go about to prove the chosen ciphertext security of this scheme? So this is known, and this is a known way to prove now young secure. I don't think it's uh, the first way to prove it secure, but there have been several proofs, proofs of uh, now young. And this is one of them which particularly meshes well with what we want to do. Okay, so you start with the uh, CCA experiment, and there, in the honest scheme, you use the secret key zero to decrypt. So if you want to decrypt, you just need one secret key, right? You rely on the consistency proof that it's all, uh, that M0 is M1, and you would get the same thing if you use the other secret key, but actually you just need one secret key, right? So then, the first thing we do in the security experiment, so we have a few game hops here, and try to randomize all challenges. The first thing that you do is you simulate all proofs. That you can do by relying on the uh, zero-knowledge simulation property. Okay, that doesn't sound difficult. Then what you could do is, the next thing is that you randomize all the M1 encryptions here. Since you simulate the proofs, you don't need a witness, so you can, you can mess around, you can play around with the right part of, of the ciphertext, okay? And now you can uh, randomize all those, because it's a mildly secure scheme, like El Gamal, think of El Gamal in the right hand if in C1 here, because it's a mildly secure scheme, it's very easy to get tight security there because you don't have these uh, decryption oracle dilemmas there that you need to be able to decrypt, but you cannot decrypt the challenge ciphertext. That you don't have here, you can just use El Gamal, and then it's very easy to, to replace or to randomize all the C1 parts and challenges that the adversary gets at the same time without any additional reduction loss. It's just one step. So this is easy. The difficult part, and what makes this really challenging, is now the next step where you say that Okay, now we actually, what we want to do is we want to randomize also the left part of encryptions. But in order to do this, we must forget the secret key, SK0, because we still use that to implement the decryption oracle, okay? And in order to do that, we need to switch into changing, the, uh, we need to switch the decryption key that we know to implement the decryption oracle, so we use SK1 instead. In order to do that without changing anything that the adversary observes. We must rely on the soundness that says anything that the adversary generates for us, anything that the adversary sends to the decryption oracle, we can decrypt with either secret key and it gives you the same results. So here we re rely on the soundness of the proof system and in fact on the simulation soundness. We've simulated many proofs for bad statements, for false statements, and now we need to rely on the soundness. So this is the hard part, the red part. Then we randomize M0 and we have randomized everything that the adversary gets, we're done. So the difficulty is kind of outsourced into this non-interactive zero-knowledge proof. It needs to be secure with a tight security reduction in the managed many-challenge setting. And it seems, uh, it seems hard to construct those creatures. So in this work, we give a slightly varied simulation or, random, or randomization strategy and a new way to prove now Jung in the multi-challenge setting, specifically geared towards multi-challenge, uh, multi multiple challenges. One uh, ingredient that we, w that we use is um, hash proof systems, and this is just a short recap of what hash proof systems are. These are designated verifier non interactive zero knowledge proofs. So there's a public key and a secret key. With a public key, you can generate proofs if you know a witness. And with a secret key, you can verify proofs. How does this work? How do you verify proofs? In the particular case of hash proof systems, 
there's a proof which is uniquely determined by the instance and the, uh, the secret key. And you can compute that unique proof either with the secret key just from X, from the instance, or from public information using a witness. And the verifier just checks if uh, his proof that he computed from the instance alone matches the, uh, the, the thing that he got in, as, a, as a proof from the prover. Uh, it's easy to simulate, because, because we can use the secret key to compute proofs, it's easy to simulate. You just apply the secret key to the instance, that's it. And we have, this is the nice property of hash proof systems, we have statistical soundness in the sense that if you know only proofs simulated, I mean they're unique, right? It doesn't matter if they're simulated or honestly generated. If you know only proofs for true statements, then any proof for a false statement in the sense of proof, in the sense of the thing that the verifier then compares it with, is information theoretically hidden. So you, the best thing is you can guess, and you, had, you have statistical security there, exponentially small error probabilities or soundness errors there. Okay, so this is the thing that we're going to use. And we know efficient hash proof systems, both for linear languages, so linear in the exponent, from uh, Kramer and Schub already, and for all languages, so for languages of disjunctions of linear statements, uh, this is particularly relevant for this talk uh, from uh, a work of uh, Michel, Fabrice, and David. So uh, Michel Abdallah, Fabrice Ben Amouda, and David Poncheval. Okay, so here's the idea for our proof system. So the ciphertext looks uh, just like with Nao Young, and the proofs look like this. We have actually two proofs and a hidden bit, or a hidden, uh, a hidden value uh, tau, which is a random bit. So I'll go into, so this looks already as it smells a little bit like Katz Wang signatures, and I'll, I'll um, give a little bit of relation to this uh, later on. And the two proofs are simply proofs for the statement that the ciphertext is consistent, that M0 is M1, or that tau has a particular value, right? So we give, so uh, pi0 proofs that ciphertexts are consistent or tau equals zero, and pi1 proofs that ciphertexts are consistent or tau equals one, which means you can always get away with simulating or with just maybe because you'd created the ciphertext, maybe you know that, um, with generating one of those pi b's, one, uh, either pi zero or pi one, for any ciphertext, even if the ciphertext is inconsistent. Because there's kind of a simulation trapdoor here, which you can select where, whether it's the left or the right proof system that you want to simulate. Um, but you cannot get away with simulating both. At least, uh, then you break the soundness in some sense. Uh, right, that's what I just said. A simulated proof breaks the soundness exactly for, for a bad ciphertext breaks the soundness exactly for one of those hash proof systems, for the uh, hash proof system uh, HSK, or with the secret key HSK, one minus tau. But the other one you can simulate, because there the statement is simply true. Okay. So be before going into the actual proof strategy, how we randomize things, here's a, here's a picture. Pictures are always good. Um, so these are all the ciphertext, the challenge ciphertext that the adversary gets, the CIs. So because I'm lazy, I just, uh, I just um, uh, wrote five there. And uh, our goal will be to partition the set of all ciphertexts, of all challenge ciphertexts, into two parts, the ones with tau equals zero. So remember that tau is, sorry, can't really operate this thing. Uh, half of the ciphertexts have tau equal, or about half of the ciphertexts have tau equal zero. Tau is the thing that uh, parameterizes the proofs, and half of them have tau equals one. So what we're going to do is in each step of the proof, we're going to randomize one half. Um, this means that, well, the other, the other half will going to be, uh, is going to be untouched, and one half will be simulated, uh, one half will be randomized. So green means the, the corresponding messages have been randomized. In the next step, we're going to create a different partitioning, again, with random taus in the challenge ciphertexts, and we're going to randomize another half of all the ciphertexts. So until, at some point, we have uh, partitioned a bunch of times, O of, uh, o of lambda times, security parameter many times, and then we have partitioned so that each time we have randomized half of the ciphertext, and after at most O of lambda steps, we will be finished, at least with high probability. So that's the strategy. But how does this work in, in, in detail? So first of all, during the security reduction, we guess um, tau star. Tau star is, so think of this as an experiment where the adversary tries to convince you of something false. 
where the adversary tries to break the soundness of the proof system, where he wants to submit a decryption query, where he can detect whether you use the left or the right secret key. Um, and this tau star is the tau value for this particular ciphertext where the adversary first tries, or where the first adversary first successfully cheats. So this is a bit so we can guess it. Um, and intuitively, this means that we have just guessed uh, for which proof system the adversary breaks the soundness first, either uh, HSK0 or HSK1. And intuitively, the adversary breaks the soundness for HSK1 minus tau star. Uh, then we randomize all the ciphertexts that, uh, that will not require the soundness of this proof system. So that all the ciphertexts that we, that we can randomize without breaking that particular proof system. Those are half of the ciphertexts. Those ciphertexts that do not lie in the same half as the ciphertext from tau star or the ciphertext with tau star. And then we uh, re-randomize, we re-randomize the partitioning, we uh, partition the ciphertext space in a different way, and then we, get, we, we go back to one. So um, the difference to Katz Wang signatures is that they also have a signature scheme where they have a different, uh, well, it's a different, um, it's a different tool, but they have, in a similar way, they, um, they kind of use some soundness of a proof system with, a, with an additional bit in proofs, if you consider signatures as proofs at this point for a zero knowledge proof system. And the difference is that this work was in the random oracle model, and there it was easy to have this partitioning bit public, but the uh, simulation capability is hidden, meaning that uh, it was hidden to the adversary whether you can simulate the left or the, the tau equals zero or the tau equals one case. Um, so the difference is kind of where the simulation capabilities lie. In our case, uh, because we're not in the random oracle model here, um, we we have to decide in advance what we can simulate and what we cannot simulate. And this is what tau dictates. Okay, so here's another il illustration. The only difference to before was that we now have a challenge cipher, or we have a C star here, which is actually a decryption query. And this is the decryption query for which the adversary breaks the proof system. Okay, thanks. Okay, and uh, the rest is as before. So we randomize everything, but we randomize it kind of around C star. Okay, I'm running out of time. There are some omitted details. How does the switching of partitioning uh, of partitionings really work? So if you just, um, uh, if you kind of in, in this picture, if you change from here to here, how does this really work? How can we forget the bit tau? And that really, it requires uh, uh, a change of uh, the scheme such that you don't really randomize initially, but you decouple ciphertext so that you, um, kind of replicate the proof system. So you kind of, you, you work your way towards a setting where you don't have two instances of, of the proof system, but uh, exponentially many. So uh, not exponentially many, but as many as you need to handle all ciphertexts differently. So, but this is a very technical part. I won't go into the detail for that. And um, the last problem is how do we get suitable hash proof systems? And we can rely on um, the work I already mentioned um, in the pairing setting. Um, yeah, we can work in the pairing setting with the work I already mentioned. And then in the DCR setting, so in an RSA type setting um, with composite order groups, uh, we simply we construct a new proof system that uses that we're, we can compute a DCR, uh, that we can compute discrete logarithms in the DCR setting. For uh, disjunctions, of course, for disjunctions of linear languages. Okay, so that brings me to the summary. Uh, the main goal was a new strategy to obtain tightly secure public key encryption schemes. And the main difference to previous approaches war was that uh, the, uh, the way in which we uh, randomize ciphertexts, in which we kind of randomize many ciphertexts at once, many challenge ciphertexts that the adversary gets, we need to randomize very many ciphertexts in very few steps. That this is uh, how we do this and how we uh, partition the set of ciphertexts is chosen adaptively at encryption time. It's not kind of hardwired into the scheme, it's chosen in the simulation or in the security proof adaptively with this special bit tau, which was not there before. So the main benefit or the demonstration why this is a useful thing and gives you some benefit over previous work is that we have a DCR-based solution. And the technical means that we is that we have a new, uh, or that we require and we also construct a new type of uh, disjunctions, in particular in the DCR setting of disjunction proofs. Okay, so, and there's more. Um, there we have a follow-up work that also shows that you can actually get this efficient in the and without pairings in the cyclic group setting. 
So um, if you're in the DDH regime, you can actually construct a public key encryption scheme with this, which is uh, green uh, in, on, on the whole uh, in the whole line, basically, which also has a small public key, small ciphertext, and um, uh, a good reduction from DDH. And we also have a result on structure-preserving signatures uh, in follow-up work, uh, where we show that you can also get tightly secure structure-preserving signatures, which are compact, at least asymptotically compact, using uh, the same ideas. Okay, that's uh, all I wanted to say. Thank you for your attention.